I'm James Hahn II. And I'm Mark LaCour. And you're listening to Oil & Gas this week, brought to you by Red Wing. This is the show for busy oil pros who want to quickly keep their finger on the pulse of the industry. This is episode 58. We are making our way toward 100. How you feeling more this morning, Mr. LaCour? I'm all so pumped up. Uh, business is great. The weather's beautiful outside. We've had no technical issues yet, so it's all good. <laughs> yet. <laughs> <laughs> yet so far so good um got to kick off the show lots of uh, a legend not only in country music but in the oil field rest in peace merle haggard straight out of the oil field to bakersfield we have a link in the extras from rolling stone great tribute rest in peace mr haggard and man so many hits i could go off for days my daddy raised me on merle and Waylon and willie and it was a rough, uh, a rough news yesterday. But watching his health decline over the last year, it, it started to feel like the end. And <clears throat> he was a bit of a tortured soul. So I, I hope he finds the peace that he couldn't find here. Yeah, but, I'm, a, I'm not a big fan of country music, but he was a legend, right? And he started out in the oil field. So um, rest in peace, Merle. Definitely. All right, breaking news, Mark. We breaking news. <laughs> we do not get everything right, and this gives a chance. For a shout out to Mr. Mike Brodinski, Brodzinski, sorry, and I'll let you take it because you you got a schooling from Mike. Yeah, and Mike, thank you so much for reaching out and and our audience. When we get something wrong, let us know um, if something's changed because we want to know too, right? There's no egos involved here. So Mike reached out to us and let us know when I talked earlier about um, how fracking does not cause earthquakes. He's actually done a study, um, and it's and I've looked at his research work and it's valid where the fracking itself doesn't increase the chance of earthquake, but the injection of, uh, of wastewater, deep, water, deep injection of wastewater, looks like statistically in certain areas close to fault zones does increase the incidence of an earthquake by about 1%. Um, so, you know, um, Mike, man, thank you for reaching out. Thank you for educating us. I'm actually I got an interview scheduled with him because I was so excited that somebody reached out to us with his knowledge and background and was able to talk through this. So, um, Fracking doesn't cause earthquakes. Uh, deep wastewater injection near fault zones looks like they do increase the chance of earthquakes. So we stand corrected. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, and when I was talking to him, he said, oh, no, oh, no, Mark, you're saying something that was believed three or four years ago. So it was possible for him to reach out and, and get us updated on the latest. Now, I will say this. There's a link that James has to a PBS Rocky Mountain News um, article about this it's so slanted the wrong way <laughs> so um you know they talk um it, you know they they sensationalize this and then later down they kind of um mention the facts but that this article is 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 trying to make it look way worse than it actually really is yeah so i will have that in the show notes at drybrocket.com forward slash tw58 for this one but we will have more more expertise coming from Mike so that we can get the full story on, on what the latest is in terms of injection wells and earthquakes. Yeah. And you know, James, I, another reason I'm glad he reached out as an industry, we need to own this, right? We don't need to hide from it. We need to talk facts, talks the truth. If we increase the chance of earthquakes and fault zones, we need to know that, right? We have the best geologists on the planet. So we should, as a, as a, as an industry, we should um, make sure we do our best to learn what's going on here. Absolutely, definitely agree. We've got to get into the stories because, goodness, it was a wild week in the oil field. I, I started off with 40 stories, so I whittled it down to the number that we have here. Let's get on into it, and we always kick things off abroad, and we have never talked about Norway other than mentioning the North Sea here and there. So from Bloomberg, crude at $40 isn't the only problem facing Norway's oil industry. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think we've probably talked about this. We we or we've hinted around this. The, the North Sea environment is not a good place to be. The fields are very mature. Um, um, it's getting expensive to get oil out of the ground over there. They're not making new discoveries. Um, so you know, forty dollars a barrel is killing them. And the fact that they can't find more um, doesn't help either. Now, interestingly enough, and, and people may not know this, but Norway knew that at some point this was going to happen. So of all the money they've made from the North Sea, they've invested into other stuff, trying to bring different businesses in, into their country, which is, you know, for a little socialist country, is actually a very smart thing for them to do. And this is a good article from Bloomberg talking about how um, there's certain blocks that were auctioned off and and really they're, they're subpar, right? The, the, 
the prospects there are, are, are nowhere near um, cost effective to get out. Now, there are some blocks that um, people have been on, our companies have been on up closer toward the Arctic um, that have high potential. There's some big reservoirs there, but of course they um, got some um, feedback from the environmentalists not wanting people to drill that close to the Arctic. So um, the North Sea is in, is in a pickle right now. It's, it's a technological um, advanced extraction and drilling extraction because of the weather conditions. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's, you know, cold, deep icebergs, all that sort of stuff. So um, I don't see the North Sea coming back. I, I see the North Sea continue to have an output that contributes to the global supply, but I don't ever see it coming back to for its heyday. What about in terms of bringing new technology to get more out of those fields? Yeah, so it's somewhere in the in the future there will be new technology. I, you know, me and um, most experts believe that that will continue to happen. But then you get into the whole price thing. Like, is that new technology in the frac fields on land more cost productive than using that technology in the in, in the North Sea? So, um, I, you know, because we're living in a hydrocarbon abundant world, I just don't see companies pumping money into the North Sea because they could pump that same amount of money somewhere else and get more out of the ground for less. Where will these companies go then? Well, Gulf of Mexico is a prime example, right? There, there's a lot of oil in Gulf of Mexico, oil and gas in Gulf of Mexico. Um, look at all the shell plays in places like um, Australia, um, and um, you know South America, and Russia. None of that stuff in China. None of that stuff even been touched yet. Um, so, I, you know, I think that's where money will be pumped in the future. I think we're in a long-term uh, low crude price market. When I say low, fifty-five, six dollars a barrel, um, and and it just it just doesn't make fiscal sense to pump money into the North Sea. There are so many, I didn't throw any, but I've seen so many people, I think it's just clickbait talking about, oh, 100's coming, 150's coming. It's just, I, I don't know why people got to do that. But anyway. So, so th th it, it might happen. It's in our realm of possibilities. When this global oversupply is, de is depleted, we're going to bounce back unbelievably quick. And if the perception out there is that we're, we're the goal so overfly is gone and we're gonna bounce back really quick that perception can influence traders which we may see a high spike it's, it's on our realm of possibilities it may go from you know 38 dollars a barrel to 90 but that spike will be is, is just a perception thing it's a short-term thing and then it's gonna settle down uh, like i said to 50 60 dollars a barrel a little shot in the arm for the attic and then <laughs> right 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 and and we don't think that's gonna happen but it is in the realm of possibilities got it all right, we've been following this story. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Saudis to sell stake in parent of state oil giant by 2018. The very big numbers in this in this one. So talk us through it. Yeah, we're looking at if they go IPO, like a trillion dollar IPO. I mean, just crazy um, because they have so many reserves that's so cheap to get out of the ground. Now, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I don't think the royal family is going to let go of, of Saudi Aramco because it's what let, allows them to control the government, um, control the country. Um, and if you read through this article in detail, this is from Fuel Fix, it's a very well-written article. They're going to sell a stake of less than 5%. Um, and, and so, you know, you're, you still have 95% will still be owned by the royal family. Um, but if they do it, it will be a huge IPO. It's going to give them a whole bunch of cash. Um, they're looking at doing some other things, which we've talked about previously. They're looking to get refining. They get, they're looking to spend, take that money and get into petrochemicals because the world has a big appetite for that. Um, Luckily for uh, people here in the U.S., we're ahead of everybody <laughs> for that export market. Um, so, um, you know, Saudi Arabia will be paying catch up to us. Um, they also talk a little bit in here about how um, OPEC and Saudi Arabia particularly are still the swing state as far as being able to keep crude prices low if there's a need for that. I disagree with it. I think in the very near future, the U.S. will be the swing state. And if we decide that we want prices to go, we control that, not not. Um, OPEC anymore. So, but good article talking about them going to, uh, to sell a stake in their parent company um, to, to raise some cash. Yeah, I'll throw it in the extras in the show notes because I didn't add it here, but it was from plantengineering.org. US, a swing producer in balancing oil and gas market, and is actually talking about uh, one of the guys from IHS that's going to be presenting at OTC. And so I'll throw that in the show notes as well. We have a lot that we can dig into on that Saudi Arabia front. Uh, one thing I do I do want to ask though is that even though it's five percent, even though it's it's five percent, that's it. It's still a royal family giving away a, a portion. But I'm connecting some dots here. Is this them also trying to build up that savings that they've been depleting? 
It could be James. It's um this is this you know I said earlier a trillion dollars is actually more like two trillion dollars. That's a lot of cash. Um, um, they could very well rebuild that savings, which I know they're going to, they're going to struggle with in the future. Um, I also see them taking that money, investing in other parts of the oil and gas industry, particularly petrochemicals, refining, ethylene crackers, that sort of stuff. Um, they're in a weird position. They have the cheapest oil to get out of the ground, but they import refined fuels and petrochemicals. They've never refined anything before, and they see the world market for petrochemicals, and so they want to try to grab some of that market. So they're going to you know, kind of uh, pivot a little bit with their economy. And instead of being their economy based on exportation of crude, they want to start um, actually manufacturing goods. They want a downstream component to their economy. Um, you know, if, just from a business point of view, very shrewd stuff, very smart because they're going the right direction. Um, do I think it's going to allow them to be able to maintain a chokehold on the uh, crude price globally? Nah, <laughs> it's too late. Too late for that. Yeah. All right, moving from one country that is abundant, in oil and petrochemicals and so forth over to a an emerging crisis nigeria energy crisis threatens the economy several stories again on this one we've actually i've, I've got two back to back to sort of give the the high level view of, of what's happening but then to give a personal view of a guy waiting for 45 minutes to get to get gas for his car so talk us through what's going on in nigeria yeah, for a country that has a bunch of crude natural gas, or I really should say crude, you wouldn't think this would be going on, but it's an infrastructure issue. Um, a lot of our listeners may not know this, but when somebody like, say, Chevron goes to Nigeria, they don't connect to the commercial grid. They have their own sewage treatment plants. They have, they, they'll, they'll build a sky rise, they'll build a skyscraper, but then they build their own sewage treatment plants and their own electrical generating plants just for their needs because the, the country's electrical and sewage and water is so unreliable. It goes down all the time. So it's interesting if you actually go to see all these um, super majors and majors out there with their own office buildings, and each one has their own generating capacity because it's the only way they can keep the thing running. So this is a good article in uh, Wall Africa about how the lack of reliable energy, electricity, and um, you know fuels, you know, diesel, jet fuel, gasoline, is hurting the country. And the reason it's going on is they, they've had a struggle with refining um, their own stuff. And once again, it kind of relates back to corruption, which the president's working on to get rid of, but also to distribute it, right? Even though you may be able to, to produce, um, you know, diesel for generators, do you have the infrastructure to be able to ship it where the generators are? In Nigeria's case, they don't. And so this is really, um, you know, this is really weighing heavy on their economy. I mean, think about it, James. Would you want to go open a tri rocket office in a place where you couldn't get fuel for your, your people and couldn't get, you know, electricity to run your computers? I mean, no. So, um, they're working. The president's working on trying to fix this. The issue is the years and years and years and years and years of corruption, especially around infrastructure projects. And you know, when you build an infrastructure, when you're building power lines or pipelines, it, you can't do it overnight. It takes time. And so this is um, just showing how it's hurting their, um, you know, their economy. And and you know, hopefully they'll be able to pull through this. All right. So you talked us through the high level. Give us the 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 recap on the thoughts of a of a tank cha tanker chaser. Yeah, so that's another good article. Basically, this, this poor guy that 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 um, that's writing this article, um, literally has just enough fuel in his automobile to be able to go to the next gas station and wait forever to get a liter of, of fuel, gasoline, and so he can't actually run his business because he can't buy enough fuel, and, it, and the fuel he buys is unbelievably expensive. So what's going on is there's this like black market, which is not good for the economy, not good for the country, of fuel so people can run their business. Um, it's 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 you know it's affecting the cost of their currency. It's um it's um it's not free market, which the government's trying to implement. Um, that means that people that are rich are able to grab resources that the poor people can't, which is also not good for the economy. So this is just just a mess. And for people in the U.S. and Europe, you just can't imagine the idea of not being able to go buy fuel for your car. But it's it happens. Yeah, it's a reality. So another reason I'm very happy to be an American, just to have the the blind, dumb luck to be have been, been born here. But yeah, all of the the corruption and the inf infrastructure issues, and then you add on top of that, just I've seen I didn't have one of the stories just showed the lines and lines. I mean, it looked like 1970s America. It was crazy. Yeah. And that's normal. That's their normal. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, I hope I hope things turn around there. All right. Let's bring things back to America because we got a big story in U.S. regulator sues Value Act over Halliburton Baker Hughes disclosures. 
and this is making a big splash around the around the interwebs. So tell us about it. Yeah. So before I get into this, I just want to read something. So I have the actual um, U.S. District Court complaint about the Halliburton Baker Hughes merger. All right. Now our government publicly talks about how we need to invest in renewables. That oil and gas is not good for the country, not good for uh, the U.S. But in this complaint, um, it says, um, I'm going to just read the introduction. Halliburton's proposed acquisition of Baker Hughes would violate Section 7, blah, 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 because it would combine two of the three largest providers of oil-filled services in the world. It would eliminate substantial head-to-head competition and would likely lead to higher prices and less innovations in this critically important industry. So their complaint says the oil and gas industry is critically important to the U.S. government and the U.S. people, but publicly they say they want to get rid of it. I, I, what the heck? I mean, <laughs> you can't do that. You can't play both sides of the fence, right? This complaint should say that, oh, um, renewables are, are going to play the major energy part, so it doesn't matter if Baker buys um, – um, uh, I mean, uh, Halliburton buys Baker, but that's not where they're going. But anyway, this we we knew this was going to happen. Halliburton knew this was going to happen. This is a good article on the intricacies of when a very large company buys another one, the stuff they have to go through with the Department of Justice to not violate antitrust things. And, you know, in the, in the U.S. government's defense, it is good that we have antitrust laws, right? We don't want people to have a monopoly. Um, but what what the government is not acknowledging is that the oil and gas industry is fundamentally changing. We're going to be in a long-term, hydrocarbon abundant, low crude price environment. And when you have that type of environment, you're going to have mergers, right? Because scope allows you to drive efficiencies. So um, they'll work this thing out. Um, what's, what's going to have to happen is Halliburton's going to have to degree, agree to divest, so basically sell off some of its business units or some of Baker's business units. I still expect this to go through. It may be another three years in the courts before it does, but it, it's going to happen because it's the nature of the industry. If it takes another three years, there was a Motley Fool article out there that I'll put in the show notes as well in the extras. In the, they, were, they were just asking the question, do Baker Hughes – stockholders win no matter what the the shareholders of both companies long-term wise win no matter what short-term wise Halliburton paid a premium so you could have exited really quick now the thing is both companies stock is, has been cut by I would say almost half in value because of low crew prices which then just shows that the, the merger needs to go through basically these companies are worth half of what they were before and Halliburton Baker both saw this coming um, now there's a little bit of a backstory it's um it's called a merger it really was not a merger. Um, Halliburton came in and forced Baker Hughes to sell itself to them. That's that's the backstory. Um, but you know that's what happens in business. And so this this I, I believe this will go through. There's still some DOJ stuff that needs to be hacked out. But it just bothers the bejeebies out of me that the government publicly says one thing about the oil and gas industry is not important and it's going to disappear, and then they file in court uh, uh, official documents saying that. The oil and gas energy is vital to the U.S. I mean, it's just that's just wrong. Politicians speaking out of the both side of their mouth. Are you serious? I've never heard of such a thing, Mark. Yeah, I, I know, I know, but it's just to see it in print. It's just, just, <laughs> it's just wrong. It's like a <laughs> oh goodness, it's like certain bands' concerts. It's okay to see on TV. You don't want to see it in person. Um, <laughs> Schlumber J's CEO warns investors that shale efficiency gains aren't sustainable. So, so some more uh, possibly. I don't know. There was just a lot of controversy going on. We didn't even mention the Panama Papers, but um, <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about this article. Yeah, so I disagree with Paul. Um, call uh, uh, Paul um, Kipsgard is the CEO of Slumberjay. Um, I think the efficiency here to say I've seen it. Um, what he's talking about is that he's saying that the efficiencies in the frack fields, especially, have been driven by the service companies like Slumberjay and Halliburton and Baker Hughes and Weatherford have cut their prices dramatically, including to the point where maybe they're just breaking even on jobs. And he's saying that when the price of crude comes back, that of course there will be inflation in the service companies and, and those efficiencies will be removed. But he's, I, I just, he's wrong. I mean, James, you and I, where were we when we had the CEO, was it Noble Energy, talking about the efficiencies they drove by installing pipelines for wastewater instead mm -hmm. of um, trucks? I mean, there's, and um, you know, I'm hot and heavy with clients looking at digital oil field in the oil and gas area. I see it, I'm, I'm interviewing, you know, oil and gas executives, and they're talking about saving, you know, 15, 20, 30 percent by implementing new technology. So um, I, I disagree with him. The other thing I disagree with him is that he says uh, Shell is a high cost oil. Shell or shale. Ground. Yeah, shale, I'm sorry, is a high cost oil to get out of the ground. You can't say that as a blanket statement. You get a good operator, 
and a good piece of property that knows what they're doing, and it's very inexpensive to get out of the ground. You get a bad piece of property or you get a bad operator, and of course their cost goes up. So there's a range there. Um, I just I don't really get why um, he's doing this. I, I suspect that this somehow is tied back to Schlumberger trying to increase shareholder value. All right, So this is something they want their investors to hear. So maybe their investors think, oh, the prices will come back, so Schlumberger's stock will go back up. But I, I, you know, I just disagree with them. The efficiencies are there, and they were going to continue to come up with new efficiencies as we look at new technologies. Well, I mentioned the the attic analogy earlier, but in the case of an operator driving efficiencies, once they get a taste of that higher margin, it seems like they're not going to want to go back either. No, they won't. I mean, it, it's self fulfilling, right? If you're an operator, or, or if you're a drilling contractor, either way. I mean, look at drilling. So we have um, we've gotten rid of. Um, um, uh, turntables and we all top drives we've got higher horsepower rigs we got rigs that can walk themselves to the drill pad that's efficiency that's not going away nobody's go back to an old rig that you got to stand up and stack you know so it's um i you know i, I just disagree so i think this is summer J ceo trying to drive some uh perception to increase shareholder value it's interesting yeah we're, we're not going to go back to my to windows 98 yeah, I mean, yeah, it's not just not going to happen. All right, over to the Wyoming Business Report. Experts say current uncertainty in oil and gas to continue, but turnaround could come soon. This is just a pretty lengthy piece, but it not too lengthy, but it, it sort of hits on some of the things that we've been talking about. Yeah, I it, I read through this. It's um, I agree with a lot of what they said. I wonder if they didn't listen to our show and write this article. <laughs> um, but they're basically saying that the oversupply is shrinking, which it is. Um, that production has fallen somewhat, which it has, and you put those two together and the price is going to rebound, and they think it's going to rebound relatively soon, um, it, which is what we've been saying since before the prices even fell. And so they talk about pressure pumping is probably the poster child for excess capacity. Can you unpack that statement for us? Yeah, so it's um, th that part of the industry has had a huge increase in activity. And they're also, once again, we talked about this earlier about technology. They're using new technology, higher horsepower per well. So it, um, it's, it's, they're able to get more out of the ground quicker and faster. Now, that's efficiencies. That is not necessarily have anything to do with the oversupply, the glut of oversupply. Yeah, yeah of course, if we ramp up production, uh, we can bring that oversupply back. But I don't see that happening. I, it's, um, the world has an enormous appetite for crude oil and natural gas. Um, that appetite is growing. So the, the consumption globally is growing. Not growing as much as it was, but it's still growing. And our ability to produce because of technology can keep pace with that growth. Um, and, and just the market um, drivers itself will, will correct stuff. What people don't, what people keep failing to understand is we're in a commodities market and it corrects itself every 10, 12, 15 years. Um, this is not new. It's the fourth one I've been through. I'll go through probably you know three or four more in my life. Um, it just happens and it always corrects itself. It always comes back. Mentions right here at the bottom about China being an over leveraged market. What are your thoughts on that? They're not over leveraged. Their economy is still growing faster than almost any other economy in the world. It's just not growing as fast as it was before. And they have a huge appetite uh, for, for energy of any kind because they need to build critical infrastructure. China's not like the US. Most of China is rural. Most of China has no electricity, no water, no sewage, no roads. Right. So they have to build all the stuff that's been in place in the U.S. and Europe for, for you know, over 100 years um, and to bring their, their population up um, to, to create that middle class, and that growth. And the Chinese government, no matter what you say, they've actually in the last 10 years done a really good job of managing that. They're building that infrastructure. They're building hydroelectric power. They realize that coal is bad for, for their air quality. So they're getting rid of coal. They're uh, you know, importing natural gas. Uh, they're building uh, petrochemicals so they can supply their own plastics and fertilizers. I mean, it's going there and it's growing. It's just not growing as fast as it was. So, you know, I, 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 you know, they make, they make a claim here that China's um, um, economy has never gone through real world stress testing. Yeah, it has. <laughs> they do it actually pretty darn good. So, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's good article, some good facts in here, but yeah, the price of crude's coming back. All right, cool. And then after price of the price of crude comes back, things are going to be fundamentally different. We keep talking about these fundamental shifts in the industry. So from Platts, U.S. oil industry business models to change post-recovery fuel for thought. Yeah, this is a great article. So we've talked about this on past shows, how I think there's a, a debt equity market that's going to be stood up in oil and gas, which is new. 
right? New source of capital. And they're talking about uh, in this article about how investors are going to look at the oil and gas industry differently, which is true, absolutely true. Um, they're going to look at it more long term. They're going to look at companies' balance sheets, um, whereas before people were just throwing money, especially to small operators, because there was so, such a big return when oil was hundred dollars a barrel. So if you think about this, if you think that investors are going to make smarter decisions, if there's going to be new sources of capital for these small independent operators, it's a good thing for the industry. Um, if we get to the point where we can control that swing production, and if we do that in the U.S., it's not going to be the Chevrons and the, the BPs of the world. It's going to be the small independent American uh, operators that are going to be able to you know, turn that faucet wide open or cut it back. If we get to the point where we can be the swing producer, we now control the global price of crude. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing for the world. So one of the paragraphs I'd like to hear your thoughts on and unpack a little bit. Public companies have much less money to buy stuff now, and they have a lot of acreage of their own. He added PE backed companies will have more fully uh, have to more fully develop their assets requiring more money and more time. So quick flips won't be as prevalent. Yeah. So PE is private equity. So, so they're, they're right. They're, they're partially right here. Some public companies have a Oops, sorry, almost cussed. I have a ton of money right now. Exxon's sitting on like 40 some odd billion dollars in cash. I mean, Exxon could go buy Chevron if they wanted to. They won't, but they could. So some, and Chevron actually is in a, a good place cash-wise too. I mean, they're, they're hurting uh, more than Exxon, but they have cash too. They're, and even um, some of the bigger service companies that have laid off a lot of people, they've kept some cash reserves because they know that they're going to need to do some acquisitions. So, you know, some public companies have cash. Most, I would say most, uh, I would say 50% of the publicly owned oil and gas, especially the operating companies, um, are, are in cash constraints right now. But I wouldn't say most of them are. Um, and then they're right. The, the private equity companies are going to have to show their value more. And that's what they mean when they say more fully develop their assets. Um, so you won't see quick flips. Uh, just like the housing bubble, where there's a bunch of people buy houses and flip them and flip them and flip them. because um, there were all these uh, bogus mortgages out there um, that allowed people that shouldn't buy a hundred thousand dollar house to buy a hundred thousand dollar house. You had that go on in the oil and gas industry for a while when oil's a hundred dollars a barrel. And this is just once again, it's going to be s smart people doing smart things with their money is going to uh, drive good stuff in our industry. All right, yeah. So downturns aren't always bad. We can't say that enough. The best of best in the refining in industry. Let's go downstream, Mister Lacour. Yeah, we've talked about this so much. <laughs> it's almost, almost, almost like we wrote this article. Um, this is in Seek and Alpha, and they're talking about some of the best downstream companies out there from a balance sheet point of view. Uh, the first one is Valero Energy, which I agree 100%. Valero does something very unique. They go out and find old mothball refineries. They retrofit them and make them super efficient. And then they buy the, the, the cheapest crude, the most sour crude on the market that nobody else wants, and they're able to refine it and make money. Nobody else can do that. So Valero is uh, is you know absolutely one of the best. Now it's not the biggest, um, and when you look at scope, scope is important in the global market for a refinery because your your products um, are are sold globally. So when you look at scope. They don't talk about Exxon Mobil in here, but Exxon Mobil is way bigger than Valero. So Exxon has more scope than Valero. Then they talk about PBF Energy. Um, I love PBF Energy. Uh, PBF Energy is um, speaking of Exxon is looking to acquire one of Exxon's refineries in California. Um, you'd go, well, Mark, why is Exxon selling a refinery if refinery is so strong? Exxon's core business is big, right? Big refineries, big fields, big super tankers. That's what they do better than anybody else. And this refinery is small, and so it just doesn't fit in their portfolio. Plus, quite honestly, and they don't talk about this here, it's in California, and Exxon's just fed up with dealing with the politics in California. <laughs> it's like, you know, if you want $7 a gallon while the rest of the country is paying two, just here, have it. I'm, I'm getting out of here. So um, PBF Energy is another rock store. Um, their their, um, their uh, balance sheet is very strong. Um, and then they talk about Marathon Petroleum. And you and I have talked about Marathon before in the show. Uh, once again, a great company, great balance sheet, um, good shareholder value. Um, and, and they do a really good job. Now, Marathon's interesting as it looks like they're trying to own more of that value chain. So instead of just buying crude on open market and shipping it to the refinery, Marathon's actually building and buying pipelines so they can control the transport. And then they're brokering long-term deals with very selective operators so that they have um, a good solid price point so they can work their refining um, margins around that because they know what the future price is going to be. So it's be interesting to see if that works for them or if it hurts them. But yeah, I, I agree completely. These are some of the top refiners in the world. 
Oh my goodness, you you brought another one out that I didn't have here, but it, it was I'll throw it again in the show notes. We, we we missed it last week from the Q and A show. It was pipeline companies threaten liens on oil producers that don't pay. That's a whole other story that that we don't have time to get into right now. But it, it just didn't let everybody know we're still tracking that story in the in the shakeout in terms of uh, of of bankruptcies and so forth. All right, you just mentioned California and Exxon Mobil. Exxon Mobil about. The Torrance refinery, they basically, it sounds like they got the green light to to go back on. It's interesting you put this in here. I think this is the first time this has ever happened with us, is that I just talked about this. I didn't know this article was in here. <laughs> Perfect. Here's, here's another Seeking Alpha story about Exxon getting rid of their Torrance refinery in California. Um, they've had some regulatory issues. They basically had an, uh, an explosion at the refinery, um, what ExxonMobil calls an incident. And um, they've had to prove to the government in California that everything's back up and safe. Now, PBF also wanted to buy this refinery, but PBF was not going to buy it until um, um, Exxon did the upgrades and fixed the, the, the things that blew up. And so it looks like they finally got there. So this uh, should sail right through uh, the regulations over there. And, you know, like I said earlier, part of this, which they don't mention here, is Exxon's just fed up with dealing with California politics. And it's like, I'm just getting out of there. So um, they're going to let PBF, who has a, a better appetite for dealing with California politics, take over this refinery. Good stuff. Yeah, you can't be mad. They they just raised the minimum wage to fifteen dollars. So get the heck out of there. I, I posted on Facebook. Uh, brace yourself, Texas. Economic oh, refugees that, that are coming. Here. Economic <laughs> ref. No, but the economic refugees are coming. Oh how, yeah. How yeah. many economic yeah. refugees have you talked to around Houston? They've been coming. I I could tell you story after story of major, I mean, large multi billion dollar companies in California that literally just have had enough. They've reached out to the government here in Texas, and they're moving their entire company and their and their employees over here because it's just so much cheaper to do business here. All right, one business that was not running above board and was founded on some nefarious dealings. Pr- pretty big story around the social oil and gas social web. OilPro.com founder indicted for a hacking rig zone. I'm just going to let you talk so that I can temper my my anger. <laughs> this is so wrong on so many different levels. So David Kent, who um, um, founded Rig Zone, sold it for I can't remember how much, 51 million or some big number yep. like that. But he, he built a back door to their database. Then he started a competitor, as soon as his non-compete was over with, called OilPro, which a lot of the industry, especially the younger people in the industry, jumped on. But he was he was stealing information from the company that he sold, so to grow his own company. And let me tell you, this industry, the oil and gas industry as a whole, has a big issue with public relations. Has a big issue with what people think about it. We don't need someone of our own doing something crappy like this that's just wrong to give us another black eye in the public. So um, he's he's in jail. Um, you know, I don't think the judge could show any mercy here, and the judge shouldn't show any mercy. And the bad thing is, think about the all employ employees that that weren't part of this, right? They a lot of them lost their jobs overnight, and this happened in an industry where people are being laid off everywhere. So this is you know for his own personal gain, this is just so wrong. I mean, I you know I hope the judge throws a book at him and he's you know he does he's out cracking rocks somewhere for the next twenty years because this is just wrong. Well, I can tell you that I spend a little time in the in the hacking underworld just so I can know what our what our um, opponents are up to. And as as someone who honestly is a fan of hacking, and I, I can't bust mainframes or do anything crazy like that, but there is good hacking and bad hacking. Hacking is a skill just like anything else that can be used for good or evil. Like and the force. It's just like the force. You can use the force. And for instance, you know, some of the earlier things that were happening where Lulsec took down the FBI website. Hey, I thought I'm all I'm all in for that because that shows we don't have enough security. Same thing with AT&T hack that happened. And you, you can watch there's a Netflix documentary called Hacker Wars that takes you through this whole thing. But regardless, if you have the ability to hack and you know code and things like that, there, there's ways that you can use it in sort of a public service kind of a way to show, well, for instance, AT&T, one of the major hack, biggest hacks in the early days was it was you could just basically put in a number and sign into the next person's AT&T account. And people on that list were select Diane Sawyer and all kinds of different people. And so from my perspective as someone who works on the works and lives and breathes on the Internet, if if you go the wrong way with that skill, I have no mercy and and no 
no compassion for you. You you deserve what you get, and judges feel the same way, and he's going to get it thrown at him. And oil, just to kind of throw this in here, Oil Pro is back online with limited capabilities. I don't know where they're headed, but personally, I'll never sign in again. Yeah, me neither. I'll never sign in again because I cannot support a company that was founded on evil, period. Yeah. Uh, that, that, not to get too much on my soapbox, but you know, David Kent deserved to be called out for that because it is just wrong. Yeah, I agree 100%. All right, let's get on to some good news. Once wedded to oil, Houston economy carries on despite bus. Yeah, this is something that a lot of people in Houston don't realize, but they should. Just look at the traffic, how bad it's gotten the last couple of years. So what's happening is a lot of companies will pick Anadarko. Anadarko has closed a lot of remote offices, which means they brought their people back here, which means those people need a place to live, which means those people need to go grocery shopping, which means they need restaurants and bars and Walmarts and everything else. So our the Houston economy is actually on a roar. If you drive down the energy corridor or downtown, you watch them tear down these Class B skyscrapers to build Class A. And it makes fiscal sense because there's a shortage of Class A office space because so many people are moving here to Houston. So our economy is on a roar. The good thing about Houston, in what was it, 82 or 83, that bus, the Houston economy is totally built upon oil. And when that bus came, the Houston just was decimated. And Houston's government learned its lesson back then, and they've diversified their economy. We have the we will soon have the largest biomedical research facility in the world, right? Um, we have uh, deep water ports, we have transportation, we have aerospace, we have NASA. So even though um, part of the our economy has been hurt, um, other parts of it are going well. Things like refining, we got eighty five billion dollars worth of refining projects in our backyard here in Houston. Um, so this is an article uh, talking about actually a particular person who was uh, worked for one of the uh, big uh, um, service companies decided to get into medical to give herself some buffer room because she knew that if the price of oil tanked that she may get laid off. So um, it's just a great article talking about how Houston's economy is doing well regardless of the price of oil. And that's a good point we're going to hit on probably on the career show that we record next, which is that a lot of your skills folks are transferable and always have a plan B because you don't know and you just got to work on yourself so that you can maximize whatever opportunity comes your way if you're laid off. Right. All right. So moving on from there, those are all of our stories. We are, we are uh, getting towards our time, but I think we got enough time to get through the rest of the stuff. So we have to um, mention right here, it's not the onion, but um, it is from Ayata, which I have an interview from Ayata on my first show. Um, I'm just going to play a couple of seconds of it here. Stuff business people say. All right. Let's play hardball. So how are we going to position ourselves? Let's hit the ground running. Let's hammer this out. Let's get our ducks in a row here, guys. All right, here's the 30,000 foot view. Let's drill that down. I'll beef it up. Can you put a deck together? Look, I'll do most of the heavy lifting. Okay, I'll put my feelers out. Can you send me the dial-in? What's the dial-in? Hey, Lauren, what's the dial-in? I just pinged her. Somebody ping Carl. Loop me in on that. Loop me in on that, will you? Can you guys loop me in on that? So what space are you guys in? Is this B to B? We're B to C. Is it C to C? We're B to C to B. We're B to C to B, but back to C, sort of. <laughs> All right. All right, let's get our ducks in a row here, Mr. LaCour. We have a winner for... Who's our winner, James? ...for another Red Wing offshore bag. This might be the last one. This might be the last one. It, our winner is C.L. Brantley from per Performance Wellhead and Frack. He's an operations manager and Performance Wellhead and Frack Components is a leading oil and gas service company specializing in surface well control equipment and related field services utilized in all phases of drilling, well stimulation, production, and intervention operations. I'm pretty fired up that a cat like that won the bag. Yeah, congratulations, CL. You will love this bag. Um, it's it's uh, great uh, for uh, bringing it out in the field, which obviously you spend a lot of time out in the frack fields. So um, uh, congratulations. So if James... We're not quite sure if we could give away more bags, but we may be giving away some other stuff. If, if our listeners want to um, get a chance to win, what should they do? They should go to tribrocket.com. I'm sorry, not tribrocket.com. They should go to redwingshoes.com forward slash podcast. And whatever we're coming up with next, it's going to be even cooler <laughs> because I've been texting back and forth. Anyone who's won uh, any knows that Chris is the global brand manager 
she's a phenomenal person to work with. And we've been co- going back and forth with some different ideas and it's going to get bigger and better. So look forward to that. In the meantime, you can still go to the website, no purchase necessary, see the official site for, for rules and details. And those rules and details might change because it might get better. And then also we have to give a shout out to our support, our other supporting sponsor, Intech WW. They have, a, or I'm sorry, IntechWW.com, which is Intech Automation. They have a white paper that I'll let Mark talk about because as our reviewers say, I lack technical experience. Yeah, so our, 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 our winner, CL, hey, CL, you ought to get you and your whole company to go download this paper. This might be something that uh, might be important to you. Uh, Intech did a great job on how you can actually drive costs down in the field. So if you're a service company and you have producing clients, this would be something you'd want to understand because it might be another product line for you to bring to your service companies. So in CL's case, he might download this paper understand what's going on and then be able to go to his clients and offer in tech services and in tech be happy with that. But if you're a producer and you're in this low crude price environment, you absolutely need to download this white paper. Uh, in tech did a great job showing how they can reduce your costs up to 50% in production. And in this low crude price environment, that's vital. So if you want to um, go check this out, it's a uh, in tech, I N T E C H W W.com forward slash podcast. So it's in tech www.com forward slash podcast. Go there. No cost. It's free for our listeners and download it. Download it. And then they will also give you a free automation assessment. Let's give a okay. shout out to Dave Weaver because he sent over a veterans link in LinkedIn. Yeah. So Dave, thanks for sending this to me. Uh, Dave is a U.S. Air Force veteran. Um, I, I got a lot of a lot of good feel, um, memories for those fly, uh, fly guys because uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, they moved me around a lot. So this is a LinkedIn um, this is LinkedIn actually donating courses and career advice for veterans. So if you're a veteran out there and you're looking at reentering the civilian world, and brother, I know how hard that can be, go here. It's free. It's LinkedIn's giving something back, and they'll help you um, figure out how to best do your LinkedIn profile, and they'll give you free courses on lynda.com, which we've talked about before, a great resource to learn job skills. So uh, Dave, thanks for sending this, and uh, for all my veterans out there, thanks for your service. Definitely. It's a, it's veterans.linkedin.com to take you straight there. Events. We got a few to talk about. I found one that Mark didn't have. <laughs> I found one that Mark didn't have. And I think it's pretty cool. Ventura oil field centennial anniversary. Yeah. So if you don't know Ventura oil field, it's one of the oldest oil fields in California. A lot of people don't know this, but California before it got all crazy politically was one of the bigger producing um, well, they're oil. still fourth, I think. So they still do. They just don't they still publicize do, yeah. it. Yeah, they have the the reservoirs there. It's just politics getting away from people actually being able to tap into that. But this is a free event. And, uh, it's the public. Um, they're going to do an educational event from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, it's going to be at the Shell Clubhouse, which is uh, – we'll put the link up to the, to the address here. But you get to learn the history of this field. And this is a lot of history um, and, and also how much um, this field has contributed to the local community. So there'll be exhibits, um, there'll be uh, food, there'll be um, um, you know experts out there, geologists, uh, uh, reservoir engineers, all that sort of stuff. So if you live in that part of the country, go check this out. This is really cool. Yeah. Any of our California listeners, and we know we ha- we do have some people in the oil fields out there in California. So head on over. I, I love it. It's such a it's such a Californian uh, line they put in here. Six hundred <laughs> Shell Road, just north of Ventura City limits. Just yeah. get on the I- no sorry. <laughs> all right, API Houston luncheon next week. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to make this. I'm going to be in Cal- – speaking of California, I'll be in California with clients. But this is a good one. So we have Kyle Cooper who's um, going to be talking about hydrocarbon inventories and implications. Think oversupply. And then uh, Pete Miller who's um, the CEO of – was the CEO of, no- of National Oil of Varco. Pete's a great guy. And National Oil of Varco has split up their services from the distribution uh, business. And now Pete is the executive chairman of Distribution Now, which is their distribution side. And he's going to be talking about the future vision of the oil and gas industry. So I, I wish I could be there. Uh, I can't, but if anybody out there is in the industry, you need to go to this. Yeah. Down there at the petroleum club, just up the street. And if anybody's looking for an excuse to go to new Orleans, who is it, Mark? <laughs> um, we got an event for you. Yeah. It's uh, I wish I could go to this one too. Once again, I got client stuff I have to take care of, but this is the GPA convention. It's basically a midstream <laughs> thing. And, and if you're in upstream or if you're in downstream, you don't know midstream, Midstream's doing very well. Not as great as downstream right now, but they're doing very well. So go check this out. And, and quite honestly, if, think of all the cities in the uh, planet 
as far as doing conventions, New Orleans is a pretty cool place to go spend a night or two. Yeah, pretty cool place. I lived there for one semester. I like to drop that on people. Xavier University, baby, XU. And you can get all of the links to these types of events because OTC is coming up and Mark is going to be giving away passes. So you go to triberocket.com forward slash events. That will take you straight to Mark's events page where you can opt in and hopefully get yourself an OTC. And then if you want to check out any of these events on our show notes, again, trybracket.com forward slash TW58. First Friday Q&A, four weeks away, Mark. Yeah, people, we need questions. We got a bunch of good ones last time, so give us some more so that we can answer your questions. Uh, remember, the goal is not to try to stump me. <laughs> you said it. You said it. You threw it out there. You threw yourself under the bus on that one. <laughs> Good stuff. But yeah, it's good stuff. But but the goal is to educate, right? Right. The goal is to educate. So if you have anything you want to know, and I mean literally anything about the oil and gas industry, uh, go to our show notes, uh, type in the question this way we don't lose it. And I will if we answer your question on the air, we will give you a big shout out. Yeah, and anywhere you go on triberocket.com there, if you're on a, a desktop or laptop, there's a orange button that says send voicemail and we'll play your question on the show. We've gotten one of those so far. So who's the next? Somebody step on up and man, stepping up, we're, we are inching ever so close to a thousand in the LinkedIn group. Yeah, that's awesome. If you listen to the show, go join the LinkedIn group. We have a bunch, and I mean a bunch of new shows coming out. You'll find out about it first on the LinkedIn group. You get to have your input there. If you want um, questions answered, you want uh, peers to help you with stuff. James and I both step in and help people, other people help you out there. So if you listen to the show, go join a LinkedIn group. You'll be so glad you did. And then another thing, just to throw this out here, if you come across news throughout the week that you'd like to hear us talk about on the show, put a link in the LinkedIn group and say, Hey, what are your thoughts on this? And you know, we'll, we'll take a look and I'm the one who curates the content. We'll see. And if it makes the cut, we can uh, we can discuss your story. Reviews, we got two new ones. Two new ones, Mark. That's two better than we had last week. That's better than we had last week. All right. Great. Uh, five stars. Big Earl 89. That is a great name. <laughs> great show. I trade oil stocks, and this show helps a lot. And then from WSCU student, Eddie, or, um, that was the title, Eddie Forty Schroeder. This is a great show for anyone looking to learn more about the industry. Being a student, this podcast gives me another source of information. Go Mountaineers! Go Mountaineers! Yay! Go Mountaineers! uh, West Virginia, correct? Yeah, because my that's that's where my grandma was from. And if you want to leave us a review, it doesn't have to be five stars. It it can be one star. If you hate us, let us know. I I, I don't know that you would have made it this far in this many shows, but either way, uh, leave us a review at tribrocket.com forward slash tw reviews and i don't know if you have anything to add mark yeah folks come on leave us a review it takes a minute and a half this helps us so much we don't charge you for this show we could we don't but by giving us uh reviews allows us to rise higher in the search engine rankings and also in in itunes so more people can find us so please personal favor go take the minute and a half leave us a review yeah and if you made it this far in the show please share it with your friends as fife would say tell your mother tell your father send a telegram Tribrocket.com forward slash share li. We'll share it on LinkedIn forward slash TW. Share it on Twitter forward slash FB on Facebook. All right, Mark, you ready to get out of here? Yeah, let's get out of here. Folks, do great work. Pay it forward, and we will see you next time. Go find some grease, guys. Back when I worked for Bell South, our management team, the sales manager team, loved these buzzwords. And so I actually made some bingo sheets of these buzzwords. And at that time, it was things like big pipes um, or um, um, 
you know, frame relay or whatever. And so I made some bingo sheets and I gave it out to my team, my sales team. We'd sit in these big meetings and we, every time one of the executives would say one of the words, we'd cross it off. And one of our, my people would, would then get, win and get bingo. And we, we all put in $20 in the pot. And so that person would win like, you know, 150 bucks or whatever. But yeah, that was, um, that was our way to entertain ourselves while we sat through these big, long sales meetings. Bingo.